Hi there, everybody. The tunesmith strikes again. King Solomon, that wise gold man, he had a thousand wives. He bought a lovely cherubong to take them all for drives. The chair broke down one day, and here's where trouble starts. His wives were waiting in a row, but he had no spare parts. Pathetic. Well, <clears throat> that's it by way of introducing a Bible story. Now, the claim is made repeatedly, endlessly, thoroughly, forever that this is a good book. It isn't. It is not a good book. It is filled with violence, the most repulsive ideas that you can possibly imagine. But there's a way of getting around it. That is not to read it. Many of you out there are Catholics. I was many, many years ago, <laughs> almost a century ago. At any rate, many of you may or may not know that the book, the Bible, was forbidden for Catholics to read until the latter part, I mean the very early part of the 20th century, actually. They didn't want you mucking around in this thing. As far as Protestants are concerned, they control it through Sunday school. They tell you what parts to read, and they don't want you mucking around either. They, it's, it's not wise. You see, you're not mature enough to understand these things. They have theologians that deal with these kinds of things. And here's your holy book, you see. Notice the page size, incidentally. Missionaries have found that this particular size of paper is, well, I don't want to go into it, but uh, they found that working with the primitive people, they're better off, you know, just doing Bible verses on it's kind of stiff butcher paper. You get my drift. Anyway, we're going to talk about uh, what I have here, and I've marked it for you, your pencils and papers, so that you can follow this thing and, <clears throat> and see whether or not I'm giving you the straight goods. This is Judges, Book of Judges, books 19 through 21. It's a rather elaborate story. I'd love to see it filmed. I don't know if you could get away with anything as obscene as something like this, but I suppose you could try. At any rate, Judges 19 through 21, and this is, the story is called The Levite and His Concubine. Right off the bat, let me describe what a Levite is. He's a priest. Uh, you see, of the 12 t tribes of Israel, the Levites were appointed to be priests for the other 11. And it wasn't an honor so much, it was something that pissed God off, and he made them uh, do this work, so it wasn't particularly an honor, an honor for them. Uh, but they would, were the ones who did the sacrifice, uh, you know, did all the prayers and did the sacrifice, which meant these guys were pretty good butchers, very good butchers. And uh, you know what was left over from the sacrifice? They could take home. So, you know, it wasn't a bad job. I'll get to this about his being a good butcher. <clears throat> now, I had a concubine. And the Bible isn't all that clear about the concubinage, uh, except to say it was less than a wife. And uh, the children uh, that would result from concubinage apparently had no particular claim on the fortune of the man. Uh, they're, for, they're there for sexual purposes. I mean, that's just essentially it. Without a c commitment to marriage, it just just for, for fun. Well, this Levite had a concubine, and uh, he lived in the countryside, it was called Ephraim, Ephraim and it's, uh, it's a region rather than a city, but he, it's a kind of open country. And uh, we're told that the concubine, we're not quite sure why, whether she was whoring on him behind his back, or whether she was just bored with him and whatever, she decides she's going to go back to her father. Her father lived in Bethlehem. And so she deserts the Levite, goes to dad, and here's our poor, poor Le Levite, you know, without the consolation of sex. <laughs> so four months pass, and he's now getting pretty horny. He's really getting horny. So he decides I better go back and fetch that woman. Uh, it's as good as I'm going to get. So he does. He takes his servant for which read slave. He takes his servant and the two jackasses loaded with his goods and so forth. They leave and go to Bethlehem. And it's there that he meets the concubine's father. 
surprise, surprise, he's a, the father is a jolly fellow. He likes the Levite, invites him in. And, you know, they have meals and drinks and tell stories. I mean, what's happening to the concubine in the meantime, I have no idea. But anyway, the Levite and, and, and old dad are getting on just great. And days pass, and you know, the Levite wants to ultimately get back to his home, but the hospitality is so great, he stays for quite some time. And then finally, he really gets it up. He's going to go. And the, uh, the dad says, well, listen, have a nice lunch here. Stay, stay as long as you can and then go. It was a bad idea because you don't want to travel at night in this kind of country. It was a lawless place. <coughs> Excuse me. So they, they start out and uh, that's, that would be the Levite, his concubine, his servant, and the two jackasses. And they make their way, and they come. It's now getting very late at night, and uh, they, they pass by a town called Jebus, 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 which later becomes Jerusalem when David conquers the, the city. But it's now Jebus, and it's because of the Jebusites live there. They're not, they're not an Israeli tribe, tribe. And the servant says, well, we better stay here. That'll be the best thing to do. And the Levi says, oh, no, no, no. He says, no, the Jebusites are strangers to us. We, we better go on. We'll go to Gebeah. That's the place for us because that's where the, the Benjamites live. We'll be safe there. Well, that's not the way it worked out. They get into, into Gebeah. Nobody greets them. There's ordinary hospitality, you know, shown strangers. None shown them. And now it's almost night and dark when an old farmer who, as it happens, had been had, from his youth, had lived in Ephraim in the same town as the Levite. And so when he comes, uh, he, he immediately takes them into his house and offers them hospitality. You know, you, you have meals here, we'll feed your animals, all the rest of it. You can, you'll be perfectly safe, perfectly safe, my eye. What happens is a mob comes at the door, banging, banging. Send out that Levite. We want to gang rape him. And if you misunderstand what that means, it means they want to screw him. You understand? Mark it well. At any rate, uh, the, the old farmer comes to the door and looks out. He says, no, he says, men, he says, don't do this terrible thing. I'm offering this Levite hospitality. No, no. What, well, I'll tell you what. I have a daughter and he has a concubine. We'll throw both of them out and you gang rape them. Well, the crowd is, maybe they're thinking about it or whatever, but what happens is that in the meantime, the Levite takes his concubine and just throws her out the door to be gang raped. Well, that's exactly what happens. All night long, that woman is just repeatedly gang raped to the point that the next morning she crawls to the door and at this point she passes out. Now we don't even know if she's dead or not, but at any rate, the Levite opens the door, sees her, he says, well, let's get going, lady, we got to get to, uh, got to get over to, um, uh, uh, to Ephraim and uh, no movement from the poor, poor woman. So he picks her up, puts it on one of his jackasses and they take off for home. Now then, once they're home, I told you guys pretty good butcher. Remember that? Good butcher? He takes the corpse. We hope she's dead now, incidentally. He cuts it into 12 pieces. And he sends each piece individually to each one of the 12 tribes of Israel. Very important. And that's what happens. And accompanying these pieces is a message to the effect isn't this the greatest uh, evil thing ever to happen in Israel? Which is an interesting thing here, you know. The crime is not against the girl who's absolutely dead and now cut into pieces. No, not against her. It's against him and Israel. Well, it's, uh, the, the various tribes get the, these pieces and everything, and they admit this is a terrible outrage and it must be avenged. We have to get after the tribe of Benjamin and make them pay for this outrage. And so they agree to meet at a place called Mizpah. Wonderful names they have in the Bible. Mark them well. 
Mizpah, and there are 400,000 troops at Mizpah to put right this awful wrong. And so they decide that in order to, to attack the, uh, the, the uh, Benjamites, they must ask God. And here's an interesting point. People who read this passage, these passages will say, oh, well, these are just stories. It has nothing to do with God. Oh, yes, it does, because God does play a part, and here it is. They start all kinds of sacrifices of animals and prayers and smokes going up, you know, the savor to the Lord and all this stuff. And they say, what, what shall we do? And God says, send out the army of Judah. It's pretty, pretty well put, you know, from the clouds, you know. Anyway, that's exactly what they do. But the Benjamites are excellent soldiers. And before the day is out, 22,000 of, uh, of the army of Judah are dead on the battlefield. Well, news comes back of this. This is pretty, this is really shaking them up pretty bad. So once again, they start the more animals, more grain, turtle doves, more smoke going up into the Lord's savor to the Lord. What shall we do? What shall we do? Send out the army of Judah once more. And so they do. This time, 18,000 of them are killed and dead on the battlefield. This is getting, you know, they're getting to be industrial strength. Death here is what we're talking about. Pretty soon there aren't going to be any Judas, <laughs> tribe of Judah left. So they, now this time they're really pouring on the sacrifice. They're really, you know, tears and wailing, gnashing, all of this. What will we do? And God says, send out the army once again, and this time I'll give them victory. He was only kidding the first couple of times, you see. <laughs> 18,000, 22,000, just child's play. Now they're going to get victory. And they do. They get victory. So they go in the town. 600 Benjamite soldiers, I don't know how brave they were. Anyway, they head for the hills. They're not about to die. But that are the only men that are left of the army. This entire bunch of the Israelites go into the town where the Benjamites were. And they kill every man, every woman, old women, young women, mothers, pregnant women. God's the ultimate abortion, incidentally. He kills not only the fetus, he kills the women bearing the child. I really get the, the number that way. All the children, babes in arms, all killed. Kill all the cattle, kill all the sheep, kill the goats, nothing. It's what I would call insane authority. I really would. I think we're dealing with insane authority. Well, they got the victory anyway. But now they take counsel. They say, wait a minute now. We have killed all the Benjamites except these 600 soldiers. There's not going to be a tribe of Benjamin anymore. We won't have a 12 tribes. Will, will any of you guys, any of you people out there, would, would you supply your daughters so that we can take care of these 600 soldiers? And of course, nobody wants anything to do with the Benjamites. Oh, no, no, not our daughters. So they take counsel long last. They think, wait a minute. Great idea. Did anybody not come to this parlay when we decided to do something about this? And the answer comes back, yes. There was a small town known as Jebesh Gilead. And they didn't send any representatives. That is sufficient reason for to join, get the armies together. We'll go there and we'll kill everybody except the virgins. And we'll give them to the Benjamite soldiers. So that's what they do. They go to Jebus Gilead and they kill everything in sight except virgins. But there were only 400 virgins available. Well, something hell. I mean, that gets that done, you know, but you still have, with 600 soldiers, you, got, you still have 200. So what are you going to do? Well, they come up with a scheme. There's a town called Shiloh. And uh, every year at about this time, they have a harvest festival. And the virgins in the, in the city go out into the fields to merrymaking and dancing and all this stuff. And what you do is you go out there, get the Benjamite soldiers, get them out there, and just grab the, the first virgin you can grab hold of, rape her right there, and she's your bride. That, that's the marriage right there. And so they do. Well, as it happened, the 200 soldiers were able to get 
200 women to rape and did. And that, my friends, is the end of the story. Now, I appeal to you. I appeal to you. Where is the moral to this story? Where is the moral? Well, one thing it tells you is that women are worthless. They're absolute, they're booty. They're entitled to nothing. You rape them, they're your wives. Or if you just don't want to have them as your wives, you say they're your, your concubines, you just have your sexual pleasure. That was what the Levite was all about. Imagine a Levite having his concubine destroyed because of his own cowardice, incidentally. And all of this occurs because of that. This is a good book. This is a good book. We'll end on a song here. It ain't necessarily so. It ain't necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, they ain't necessarily so. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for my next song. I'll sing a little number. It was written especially for me by George and Ivor Gershwin, and I thought, oh, well, that's for a different program. Goodbye. <laughs>